Now we'll move on to discuss the arteries and veins of the upper and lower limbs, including the arteries and veins of the shoulder and upper limb, and the arteries and veins from the lower limbs. This image depicts the arteries that supply the upper limb. Blood is brought into the upper limb through the right subclavian on the right side of the body. This gives rise to the axillary artery and eventually the brachial artery. Around the shoulder region, the lateral thoracic artery, the subscapular artery, and the anterior humeral circumflex artery branch off. In the upper arm region, in the region of the humerus bone, the superior ulnar collateral and the brachial artery continue. In the lower area of the arm or the forearm, the radial and ulnar arteries stem and the anterior interosseous artery. In the palm region of the hand is a deep palmar and superficial palmar arch. These give rise to the digital arteries. The subclavian arteries supply blood to the upper limbs, chest wall, shoulders, back, brain, and the spinal cord. There are three major branches of the subclavian. The thyrocervical trunk, which provides blood to the muscles and tissues of the neck, shoulder, and upper back. The internal thoracic artery, which supplies the pericardium and anterior wall of the chest, and the vertebral artery, which delivers blood to the brain and spinal cord. The arteries of the pectoral girdle and the upper limb. The muscles of the axilla and the pectoral region are supplied with blood from the axillary artery. And the axillary artery itself is the continuation of the subclavian artery as it leaves the thoracic cavity. As the subclavian artery passes the border of the first rib, it becomes the axillary artery. And the axillary artery in turn becomes the brachial artery, which supplies blood to the upper limb. As the brachial artery extends along the humerus bone at the cubital fossa, it divides into the radial and ulnar arteries. These arteries provide blood to the forearm and join together at the wrist to form the superficial and deep palmar arches. This provides blood supply to the wrist and to the digital arteries, which provide the blood supply to the thumb and fingers. The veins of the upper limb. Beginning in the fingers and thumb are the digital veins. The palmar venous arches deliver the blood into the basilic, anterior interosseous, and cephalic veins. The radial and ulnar veins ascend the blood towards the upper arm and shoulder region in the basilic, brachial, and cephalic veins. These veins drain the blood from the upper limb into the subclavian vein. The venous blood flow from the fingers, hand, wrist, and arm drain into the left brachiocephalic and then into the superior vena cava. The blood flow is as follows, beginning at the digital vein, the blood from the fingers is drained and delivered to the superficial and deep palmar veins of the hand. These veins make up the palmar venous arches. The superficial arch empties into the cephalic vein and eventually into the median cubital vein. The deep palmar arch empties into the radial and ulnar veins. These eventually empty into the brachial vein. The brachial vein delivers the blood into the left axillary vein left subclavian vein, and then the left brachiocephalic vein. The arteries of the lower limb. The common iliac and the internal and external iliac bring the blood flow into the pelvic region and eventually on to the lower limb. In the thigh region, the arteries include the mitral femoral, the deep femoral, and the femoral artery. The lateral femoral circumflex around the hip region. In the knee region, the popliteal and the posterior tibial, in the shin or lower leg area, the anterior tibial and the fibular artery. The dorsal pedis and the dorsal arch in the ankle region. The blood flow to the lower limb travels in the external iliac arteries from the pelvic region of the body. The external iliac artery gives rise to the femoral artery and close to this point, the deep femoral artery branches off. The deep femoral artery supplies blood to the hip joint and the deep muscles of the thigh. 
It also gives rise to the medial and lateral circumflex arteries. As the femoral artery extends down the thigh at the popliteal fossa, it gives off a branch known as the descending genicular artery. This artery supplies blood to the medial aspect of the knee. Arteries of the lower leg and foot. As the femoral artery approaches the knee, it becomes the popliteal artery. This delivers the blood flow to the lower leg and foot. When the popliteal artery crosses the popliteal fossa, it branches into the posterior and anterior tibial artery. The posterior tibial artery gives rise to the fibular artery and extends down the back of the tibia bone. The anterior tibial artery extends between the tibia and fibula bones and supplies blood to the skin and muscles of the anterior portion of the leg. One of the arteries of the foot is the dorsal pedis artery and it arises from the anterior tibial artery. This artery provides the blood supply to the ankle and dorsal portion of the foot. The posterior tibial artery gives rise to the medial and lateral plantar arteries. These supply blood to the plantar surface of the foot. The distal portion of the foot and toes are supplied with blood from the dorsal and plantar arches. The veins of the lower limb. The venous drainage of the lower limb begins with blood leaving the sole of the foot in the plantar veins. The anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and the fibular vein are the deep veins of the lower leg. These veins drain into the popliteal vein and eventually into the femoral vein. The great saphenous vein is the longest vein in the body and it's used during coronary bypass surgery. The tibial and fibular veins join together to form the popliteal vein. The femoral vein receives blood from the great saphenous vein, deep femoral vein, and the femoral circumflex vein. The femoral vein then drains the blood from the lower limb and delivers it to the external iliac vein in the pelvis. The veins of the pelvis. The veins of the pelvis include the medial sacral, internal iliac, and common iliac, as well as the superior gluteal vein. The external iliac vein receives blood from the lower limb. This vein travels across the inner surface of the ilium bone of the hip until it merges with the internal iliac vein. The internal iliac vein drains the blood from the pelvic organs on that side of the body. The internal iliac veins are made up of the gluteal vein, the internal budendal vein, obturator vein, and the lateral sacral veins. The internal and external iliac veins join to form the common iliac vein. The left and right common iliac veins unite at the level of the fifth lumbar vertebra and form the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava delivers the venous blood from the lower portion of the body, including the lower limbs, into the right atrium of the heart. Changes in the cardiovascular system that occur after birth. These include the closure of the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale facilitates blood flow directly from the right atrium to the left atrium during lung development in utero, and this opening closes within 48 hours after the birth of the baby. The second is the developmental shunt between the pulmonary artery and the aortic arch closes, and this is known as the ductus arteriosus. This normally closes within the first 24 to 48 hours after birth. The failure of these developmental attributes of the cardiovascular system to close as expected can lead to significant consequences. For example, the failure of the ductus arteriosus to close for long periods of time causes difficulty breathing due to fluid buildup in the lungs. This is caused by the excess blood flow into the lung vasculature. The effects of aging on the cardiovascular system. As we age, there are a number of changes that occur in the cardiovascular system, including the heart. The heart itself enlarges slightly as we age, and the capacity to meet the increased cardiac demands of exercise is reduced. Also, the elastic recoil of the arteries decreases and the blood vessels become more rigid. This increases the demand on the heart to maintain blood pressure at rest and can lead to an increase in blood pressure. 
The following is a clinical note on coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is also known as atherosclerotic heart disease. This disease involves the accumulation of atheromatous plaques in the coronary arteries. This limits or blocks the normal blood flow. The reduced blood flow leads to a decrease in the perfusion of the myocardium and this results in chest pain or angina and can result in altered heart function. Coronary artery disease is diagnosed based on physical exam, symptoms, and the results of coronary angiography or an angiogram. Coronary artery disease is the number one cause of death in North America and in most countries of the world. The treatment for coronary artery disease includes the use of medication to lower cholesterol, the treatment of the angina or chest pain, angioplasty, and in some cases coronary artery bypass surgery.